so the work that I'm talking about today is in collaboration with um, Lauren Childs, who is an assistant professor of mathematics at Virginia Tech. Um, so we've been working on this problem of modeling malaria dynamics within the mosquito for a number of years now, and I'll talk a little bit about some of the work that we've done so far. So I'll begin with a bit of background about the disease malaria. And I want to talk about how we can go from these complex biological systems and then use mathematics to abstract that biological system into something that's simpler to work with. And then hopefully we can use these models to try and answer some, some concrete questions about that, that biological system. And a couple of those questions that we have addressed thus far are how to measure parasite diversity and how to measure time to infectiousness. So that's what I'm going to focus on for today. The World Health Organization estimated that there were 228 million new infections in 2018, resulting in over 400,000 deaths. And about 65% of those deaths, unfortunately, affect children under the age of five. Um, the greatest mortality is caused by this pathogen called Plasmodium falciparum. Um, and this is transmitted to humans via um, female Anopheles mosquitoes. Uh, and if we look at the, the life cycle of that plasmodium parasite, it's really complicated, requiring both a vertebrate host, such as a human, and this female Anopheles mosquito to complete a full life cycle. So mosquitoes are infectious when they actually have the parasites in their salivary glands. So when they take a blood meal from a human, they can inject some of those parasites into the human. And the key thing that I want to, to drive home is that asexual reproduction of the parasite happens inside the vertebrate host, and then sexual reproduction happens inside the mosquito. So after uh, various processes within the human, eventually those asexual parasites differentiate into male and female gametocytes. And it's at that point that the human is infectious to mosquitoes. So now when that mosquito takes a blood meal from the human, they can ingest those male and female uh, gametocytes. Uh, sexual reproduction happens inside the mosquito and the parasite undergoes several different life stages, including a zygote stage, an eukinete stage, an oocyst stage, and a sporozoite stage, which I'll describe in more detail later on. But again, the key is that sexual reproduction occurs inside the mosquito, and this is why we were interested in focusing on that particular um, stage of the life cycle, uh, because there's the opportunity for new parasite genotypes to arise um, during this um, the fertilization process within the mosquito. So why do we care about diversity of this plasmodium population. Um, there are a number of reasons, and one is that new strains of the parasite can better evade the host immune system. So here's just one example um, taken from some data in Sudan. Um, on the vertical axis, we have on the left the prevalence of asexual infection. So that's the proportion of individuals in the population that harbor the asexual stage of the parasite in their blood. And we're looking at this over time. And the top, uh, the top curve here with the solid line and the, and the black boxes um, corresponds to individuals who have um, more than one parasite genotype in their blood. Whereas the dashed curve corresponds to individuals that are infected with just a single parasite genotype. And so what we see is that infection seems to last longer in the population when it's a more diverse infection. So when there's more um, genetic diversity amongst the plasmodium parasite that's within an indiv individual person. On the right hand side, it's a, the gra a graph of the same thing except for the gametocyte stage, the, the sexual stage of the parasite within the human. And so that um, has important implications, um, not just for the individuals that are infected, um, taking longer to recover, but also um, implications for how easy it is to transmit to, to, hum to, to mosquitoes. And this also poses challenges for drug and vaccine development. The more diverse the infection, um, then the more challenging it is to treat that infection. And in fact, um, we keep on having to come out with new uh, malaria uh, treatments because parasites are, are emerging that uh, develop drug resistance to these treatments and, and then spread through a population. 
and vaccine development have, has been extremely challenging. Um, it took uh, about 30 years to get um, an effective malaria vaccine. Um, the commercial name is Muscirix. Um, and it still has limited efficacy um, and the duration of the efficacy is, is still quite short. And then there are some studies that indicate that a more diverse infection uh, can also lead to more severe symptoms for that infected individual. So in order to be able to capture um, or to try and understand what is uh, what kind of diversity we have and what, what uh, the mosquito biology, um, how that mosquito bi biology actually impacts the creation of genetic diversity in this um, plasmodium population, we need to understand what the mechanisms are that can create new uh, parasite genotypes. And so here I've listed three of these. Uh, so the first super infection results when a person is infected um, or is bitten by two different mosquitoes that might be harboring uh, plasmodium parasites of different genotypes. And so that person can then be infected with two different genotypes simultaneously, which means that when a mosquito bites that person, they can pick up two uh, genetically distinct parasite populations at the same time. And then as I mentioned before, sexual reproduction of the parasites inside the mosquito can also result in new parasite um, uh, genotypes. And then finally, random mutation can also lead to new uh, genotypes. And this is the one thing that we have not yet considered in our mathematical models. So I'm going to be focusing on, on the effect of sexual reproduction in terms of, of the ability to generate new parasite uh, diversity. So the approach that we took here was to develop a model that has two different stages. In the first stage of the model, we modeled parasite dynamics within the mosquito, assuming that the mosquito ingests two genetically distinct populations of parasites. And uh, the goal here was to try and reproduce the variation in parasite numbers across a population of mosquitoes, which need, means that we needed to introduce some randomness into um, this stage of the mathematical model. And then once we know something about the temporal dynamics of the parasites across a population of mosquitoes, then we want to tie to that a model that is able to um, simulate the mechanisms that can create novel uh, genetic sequences for these parasites. And uh, in particular, we consider reassortment and recombination, which I'll describe later on. And again, mutation in reality, of course, does happen, but we don't consider random mutation in the model I'm presenting today. And then the goal there is to use some metrics to try and quantify the diversity that's generated at different stages of the parasite life cycle within the mosquito. And we can visualize that framework in the following way. So on the left, we have stage one where we are modeling uh, the parasite uh, numbers over time within a single mosquito. And so the output there is the, again, the temporal parasite dynamics within a single mosquito. And we want to keep track of certain uh, quantities along the way, which will then feed into the second stage of the model. So in particular, we're going to keep track of the number of oocysts that rupture and the number of sporozoites of each type. And what those words mean will make a little bit more sense in a little bit. And then the second stage of the model, which I'm illustrating on the right, is where we um, assign specific sequences to each of the uh, parasites from this first stage of the model and then simulate reassortment and recombination to see what kind of sequences we end up with at different stages of the parasite life cycle. So when we started this project, um, there was very little work done on modeling parasite dynamics within the mosquito. There are a lot of malaria models that look at um, how to um, model population level disease dynamics. And there's a lot of work done on modeling parasite dynamics within the vertebrate host, specifically humans. Um, but the first mathematical models that we are aware of that look at modeling parasite dynamics within the mosquito is this work that was conducted by Miranda Thibault Wunkum and Thomas Euster in 2010. And so we build off of this framework um, which looks something like this. So here we have um, male gametes fertilizing female gametes at some rate uh, given by 
um, R times M times F. So here it's assumed that the fertilization rate is proportional to the product of uh, the size of the male and female gamete population. They fuse to form a zygote, and then they progress from a zygote to an eukinete stage at some rate. The eukinetes progress to an oocyst stage at some rate. And in reality, there's sporoblast formation that happens inside the oocyst. Um, but rather than trying to model that, that complicated um, step of the parasite life cycle, instead it's assumed that the oocyst will rupture after some uh, period of time, um, given by this bursting function K of T. Um, and uh, once the oocyst bursts, a certain number n of sporozoites will be released from that oocyst, and a proportion of those released um, sporozoites will successfully migrate to the salivary glands of the mosquito. And again, it's those parasites in the mosquito salivary glands that can then be passed on to a human. And so we can take a picture like this, which is a nice abstraction of the, this very complicated um, mosquito or parasite life cycle. And we can write down those dynamics as a system of ordinary differential equations. So here, for example, M prime is the rate of change in the male gamete population. Z prime is the rate of change in the uh, zygote population and so on. So for example, we can reduce the male gamete population um, at a rate given by the, um, the fertilization rate, which here is given by this R times M times F. Uh, and what's not uh, illustrated in this flowchart is um, the decay in the male gamete population um, as a result of just a natural die off of those male gametes. And that's given by this first term. So the male gamete population can only decrease and it decreases according to this natural mortality rate and through this um, fertilization rate. And when the male uh, gamete fertilizes the female gamete, that produces a zygote at the same rate. And so that's why we see that term appearing um, as a positive term in the zygote equation. And so as I mentioned, uh, bursting happens at this, bursting of the oocysts happens at this rate K of T. And the uh, mathematical model developed by um, Miranda Thibault Wunkem assumes that this, uh, this bursting rate is a stepwise uh, function so that there's no bursting um, prior to some time t naught, and after that bursting occurs at some constant rate. And then the sporozoites release again some fixed number of sporozoites and a proportion p of those sporozoites successfully migrate to the mosquito salivary glands. For our problem of trying to uh, estimate the amount of diversity that we would see in the parasite population um, after um, at different points in the parasite life cycle within the mosquito, we needed to introduce some stochasticity, some randomness into the parasite dynamics. So we would expect that if we were to look at a number of infected mosquitoes, that the parasite dynamics in those different mosquitoes would look different. And so that's where uh, we um, turn to this particular type of model called a continuous time Markov chain, where time is continuous, but the state is discrete. And I wanted to give just an idea about how we actually structure that model. So first of all, we start out with a vector um, that denotes the initial number of parasites in each of the parasite life cycle stages. So when a mosquito first takes that infectious blood meal from a human, the only stage of the parasite that we're going to have is the male and female gamete stage, and then the remaining, remaining stages will have zero individuals. And then we need to choose, uh, there's a various uh, types of events that occur. For example, mm -hmm. a death of a male gamete could happen, a mating event could happen. Once you have a zygote in the population, you could have the bursting of an oocyst, and so on. So what we need to do is figure out the timing of uh, these events. So we want to, to know when the next event happens, and then we pick which event happens. And that's where some of that randomness comes in uh, to the mathematical model, choosing the time of the next event, and then choosing which event happens. So if, for example, the next event is uh, the, is a, a um, the death of a male gamete, then we lose one male gamete and all of the remaining parasite life cycle stages stay the same. So we would take this vector and add it to our initial condition vector. Likewise, if the next event were 
um, a mating event, then we expect to lose one male gamete, lose one female gamete, and gain a zygote. And again, we would take this vector and add it to the previous state vector that we had. One additional change that we made is uh, to, uh, instead of having a stepwise bursting function, we have a continuous sigmoid bursting function for the oocyst, which means that oocyst can burst at any point in time, but it's going to uh, happen with low probability or low likelihood um, up to a certain time t naught, and then you'll see a rapid increase in that bursting rate, which will eventually start to level off. And this is an example of what those parasite dynamics look like. Uh, so um, first we have the, uh, the zygote population, the eukinete population, oocyst, and sporozoites. And a lot of what I talk about today is going to be focused on the oocyst and sporozoite population. Each gray curve here represents the simulation, one simulation of this, this stochastic model. And another way of thinking about it is that each gray curve represents the parasite dynamics within an individual mosquito. And what's represented here are the parasite dynamics across a population of 100 mosquitoes. The blue solid curve is the mean across those um, simulations, those 100 simulations. And the black uh, solid curve is the, the uh, solution to the deterministic model. And so you can see that there's very good agreement between the deterministic model and the mean across the stochastic simulations. The only exception is this, this turning point here uh, because of the difference in how we model uh, oocysts bursting. So one thing I want to point out to you, though, is that there's a lot of variation around this mean, where we have uh, some uh, in some mosquitoes, the parasite persists all the way to day 21. And so that mosquito would become infectious and has the possibility of passing on an infection to humans. And then in other mosquitoes, the parasite um, dies out before reaching the sporozoite stage. And so if you start out with a uh, blood meal that has a low gametocyte density, then about 63% of our stochastic simulations, or in other words, 63% of these mosquitoes will become infectious by day 21. Whereas if you start with a high number of gametocytes in that initial blood meal, almost all of the mosquitoes are going to be infectious by day 21. And it turns out that that variation is really important for being able to act uh, accurately capture parasite diversity at the oocyst and sporozoite stage. The next step was to extend this uh, to include diversity in that starting parasite population. So we took the simplest case where we have two genetically distinct parasite populations that's ingested by the mosquito. And so here um, I denote one parasite population uh, by, by one or the color blue and the other by the color red. If a male gamete fertilizes a female gamete of the same type, then they produce a zygote of the same type. On the other hand, if a male gamete fertilizes a female gamete of a different type, then they produce a new type. And so in the end at the zygote stage and the subsequent stages, there are four possible um, parasite populations. We wanted to introduce some kind of difference between the two parasite populations. And so we introduced a, a fitness bias so if there's a 10% fitness bias, what this means is that we assigned a 10% higher mortality rate to um, the population two compared with population one. And then we had to make a decision about how we assign uh, a mortality rate to the offspring. And so we, we took the simplest thing, which was to assume that the uh, offspring uh, have a fitness that is the average of their parents. So in other words, their mortality rate was the average of their two parents. So coming back to the uh, model framework, um, so I've described so far the parasite life cycle model within the mosquito, but now we need to assign sequences to those starting populations, our two genetically distinct parasite populations that the mosquito has ingested. So we need to have some way of assigning a sequence to those two starting populations. And the approach that we took is called a barcode characterization. Um, so before I dive into, into what that means, um, I briefly want to mention 
that a single nucleotide polymorphism or a SNP is a um, variation at a single position along the genome. Um, and uh, at that position, uh, one of two genes can be, um, or sorry, a variation in a gene can be presented. And in this particular case, um, in this article in Malaria Journal, um, the authors were able to identify 24 SNPs where um, uh, two variants of a gene or an allele can be expressed that would be sufficient to distinguish between genetically distinct Plasmodium falciparum parasite populations. And so this is really useful for us because instead of having to try and encode the entire parasite genome, we can instead just encode a sequence of length 24 um, and we can designate those different um, variants or alleles uh, by either zeros or ones. And this is a depiction of what that data actually looks like. So for the Plasmodium falciparum, there are 14 chromosomes. Each of these horizontal lines represents a different chromosome. And the diamonds represent the location of the SNPs on each of those chromosomes. So for example, the first chromosome has two SNPs, the second one has one SNP, the third chromosome has none, and so on. And this is what the data actually look like. So in that first column, we have our SNPs 1 through 24. For each of those SNPs, we have which chromosome it lies on and where along the chromosome it's positioned. And we use all of that information to simulate uh, reassortment and recombination. So this is what this, this is how we were able to abstract that idea um, and model this uh, system. So for convenience, I'm illustrating the, the um, most extreme case where the two starting parasite populations um, differ at every, uh, every one of these 24 positions. So black represents one of those alleles and white represents the other. And so again, in, when we actually encode this, we represent this by a sequences of, um, so this could be a sequence of all ones, for example, and this, uh, these white blocks would be represented by a sequence of all zeros. And you'll notice that there are um, these gaps between these groups of blocks. Um, so what that means is, so each one of these blocks represents a SNP. So chromosome one, for example, has two SNPs. And since they're on the same chromosome, we group them together in this visualization. And then uh, this next grouping had just one SNP we skip over the third chromosome because it didn't have any SNPs on it. And then the fourth chromosome has one SNP, which is represented by um, an isolated block. Whoops. So now that we have this uh, representation, we can try to visualize how we actually model recombination and re reassortment. So here, a male gamete fertilizes a female gamete of a different uh, type. And that brings together the genetic material at the zygote stage. At the oocyst stage is where we actually model these, the crossings between these different uh, sequences. So first, recombination is designated by an X in this, this little cartoon of this process. Um, so we have to first figure out where uh, this recombination event is going to occur. We, we randomly pick which chromosome this uh, recombination event is going to occur on. And then we need to choose a location along that chromosome. Once we've done that, then we swap the SNPs. We essentially, it's like cutting the chromosome and then swapping the, the SNPs that come along with it. So if you look over here, you'll see that where we had all black blocks is now all white blocks. And similarly on this uh, chromosome, the white blocks become black blocks. Next, we can simulate reassortment. And so again, there we choose a particular chromosome and this time we swap the entire chromosome. And so all of the SNPs that were on that chromosome come along with it. So here where we had a black block on the top and a white one on the bottom, now over here we have a white block on the top and a black block on the bottom. So this is just a visual representation of what we actually do in our um, simulations. And what I wanna point out here is that this particular example that I've shown you results in four different parasite sequences. Uh, and in particular, two of these happen to be the same as their parents. 
Uh, but you can imagine performing another recombination event that then uh, creates changes this particular sequence into something that's different from the two parents. And then we could perform another recombination event that also changes this one to something new. So that means that we can get up to four unique sequences that are different from the starting population. And that means that at the sporozoite stage, we can get up to four unique sequences. And again, they could all be different from the starting population that was ingested by the mosquito. So I mentioned before that we needed to come up with some metrics to actually quantify diversity of the parasite population at the oocyst in the sporozoite stage. And uh, one of these is very simple. We just count the number of different sequences, the number of unique sequences. So on the left, we've, we've simulated the model assuming that the underlying parasite life cycle model is that deterministic differential equation. And on the right, um, we're assuming that the underlying parasite life cycle model is that stochastic model that I described. And so the one on the right is what we think is the more realistic thing since we expect a population of mosquitoes to have different parasite dynamics occurring inside them. And so you can see that you get very different pictures depending on what is assumed about the degree of variation in the parasite dynamics within the mosquito. On the horizontal axis, I'm plotting the mean number of unique sequences across this population of mosquitoes. And on the horizontal axis is the number of starting positions different. So in that cartoon that I showed you, um, I showed the extreme case where they differ at all 24 positions, uh, but we looked at a number of simulations starting from uh, one position different all the way up to 24 positions different, and then calculated the mean number of unique sequences across the, the population of mosquitoes. And the different colors here represent or correspond to the different initial gametocyte density. So the darkest color corresponds to a low initial gametocyte density in that blood meal that the mosquito took. And the lightest color represents the highest initial gametocyte density. And so what we see is that there is a rapid increase in the diversity um, as you increase the number of starting positions different, but then that starts to saturate once you get past about five starting positions different. And as you might expect, the amount of diversity that you can obtain increases with an increase in the initial gametocyte population. So this gave us some insight into how diverse the parasite population was at the oocyst stage. But one of the things that we are interested in is what does this actually mean for onward transmission to humans? Because as I mentioned earlier, um, a more complex infection in a human can have important consequences, such as the ability for that person to actually clear the infection or to be treated effectively. So what we did to address that question is uh, to, to, to randomly sample 10 sporozoites from the salivary gland, glands of these uh, simulated mosquitoes and assume that that's what gets passed on to a human. And so we counted out of those 10, uh, 10 sporozoites, what fraction of them um, or how many of them are unique sequences. So the black bars correspond to one genetically distinct population in that infectious bite from mosquito to human. The brown corresponds to two genetically distinct populations. And then this tan color corresponds to three or more distinct populations. So if we start with the low initial gametocyte density, more than 50% of those infectious bites will contain three or more genetically distinct populations, which means that at least one of them had to be different from the two starting populations meaning that about half of these uh, new infections will introduce a novel parasite sequence. If we start out with a high initial gametocyte population, then we have about 90% of those infectious bites from mosquito to human harboring three or more genetically distinct populations. So our uh, model here suggests that novel sequences are frequently passed on to new infections. The caveat, however, is that these results will, of course, depend on our choice of different functional forms in our model, in particular things like the bursting function. Um, it will depend on the choice that we make for the model parameters, what values we actually stick into those parameters will change the outcome. 
So what we wanted to do next was see if we could find some data that we could use to actually inform model parameters for a within mosquito parasite model. And in particular, we wanted to use that to see if we could measure the time that it takes for a mosquito to become infectious after ingesting that initial blood meal. And so this here is an illustration of those various, uh, those various parasite life cycle stages from the ingested gametocytes all the way to the sporozoites and the salivary glands, um, at which point the mosquito is infectious to humans. And then the figure down here uh, is showing how drastically those parasite numbers can actually change over time. But what we're interested in really is to estimate how long this process takes, uh, because the time to infectiousness, um, so here you see it's on the order of about two weeks, um, but that's also about the order of the mosquito lifespan. So if this process is fast, then that could mean that it's easier for that mosquito to pass on an infection before it dies. So this is a really critically important epidemiological um, uh, parameter, the extrinsic incubation period or the time to infectiousness. Unfortunately, there is some data out there um, that we found from a um, doctoral dissertation actually, where they conducted a number of, of really nice experiments where they fed mosquitoes blood that had um, the Ukanit stage. So this mean, meant that they were able to better control what the initial density of the parasite population was um, in that initial blood meal. And then they dissected these mosquitoes to count the number of oocysts over time and record um, some information about how many sporozoites there were over time. In particular, they calculate a sporozoite score. So this is what the, the mean across that data looks like for the oocyst count. Um, so the, the points here are the mean oocyst count over time. And they conducted three experiments. Um, the difference between each of these figures is in the number of ukanites that the mosquito ingested. So in the first two experiments, they, they considered three different initial ukanite densities, and then they considered another three additional ukanite densities in this last experiment. So in the end, there are really six different treatments that we consider, six different initial ukanite densities. And so one of the things we wanted to look at is how the estimate of the time to infectiousness depends on that initial ukanite density. Density. And so the solid curves here are the fits of some simple mathematical models to this data. And so you can see that, that those models did a really nice job of fitting to that data. And we were able to reproduce those results ourselves. They then look at a second model and fit that model to the sporozoite score to try and estimate some parameters related to sporozoite production. And again, you can see a reasonable fit uh, between the model and the data, which we were also able to reproduce. And this is what those two models look like from that doctoral thesis. So on the left, there is a model that was fit to this oocyst data, and on the right is a model that was fit to the sporozoite data. For our purposes, um, we needed to construct a model that we could fit simultaneously to the oocyst and the sporozoite data. And so initially we tried making some combination of these two things. And what we found is that um, it was not able to simultaneously capture the oocyst data and the sporozoite data. And so that actually ties in with one of the questions that was asked, asked during the keynote address about how, can, how do you decide how much complexity to put into a mathematical model? And uh, here the data helped us make that decision. So if we, we tried a number of different models and, and none of them were able to initially fit both the oocyst and the sporozoite data simultaneously. And so we had to stare at the data some more and think about what features, um, why, what, why was it that we were not able to capture uh, certain features in the data using the models we initially came up with. And so one of the features that we um, weren't able to capture initially was the fact that there's this rapid increase in the oocyst um, population followed by a rapid decrease, and then this kind of leveling off. This, this red curve here looks like it's going to zero, but if you look at the actual data, it's still remaining fairly high after you know 30 some odd days, um, which is a long time for a mosquito.
Um, and initially our models were not able to capture simultaneously this rapid increase and then leveling off at some positive um, value. And additionally, uh, those models were not able to simultaneously fit this kind of sigmoid shape that we observe in the um, sporozoite uh, data. So we needed a model that could try to capture both of those things. And what we found was that we needed to separate um, bursting oocysts from non-bursting oocysts. That allowed us to capture simultaneously this dynamic in the oocyst population and uh, this kind of sigmoid shape in the sporozoite population. And there's one other thing that we need to capture the dynamics in the sporozoite population. We need to think about how to incorporate uh, oocyst bursting into the model since sporozoites don't appear until an oocyst bursts. So on the right, we have a model where we assume that the bursting happens in the same way as the first model that I introduced, where the bursting is a sigmoid, a continuous sigmoid function. Another way of trying to approximate those dynamics is by breaking up the oocyst stage into um, some number n of compartments um, with the same transition rate between each of the compartments. That um, has uh, important implications. So if we had just one oocyst stage with this linear rate of leaving that stage, then this would imply that the time that you spend in that stage is exponentially distributed. Whereas if you have a number of these oocyst stages, that results in a gamma distribution. So what does that actually mean? Well, for those of you who are familiar with the gamma distribution, this is the probability density function for the gamma distribution. And that's what I've plotted in the first figure here for different numbers of these oocyst compartments. And the second graph is the cumulative distribution function. And so the way to think about this is that this cumulative distribution function will essentially mimic the shape that we would see in the sporozoite population. So if we start out with a small number of oocyst stages, like two, we get this kind of shallow increase. So you get oocysts bursting almost immediately, and then the increase is really shallow, which is not what we see in that uh, sporozoite data. And then as you increase the number of stages um, while keeping everything else in the model the same, then uh, this delays um, the the uh, increase in the sporozoic population, and then you have a more rapid increase um, around uh, this, in this case, day 20, just for in this illustration. So we wanted to try and figure out which of these models was a better representation of the data, which better explains the data. Um, so first we, want, we looked at just model one, and we wanted to know what is the optimal number of oocyst compartments to best capture the data. And then we wanted to decide between model one and model two, assuming that we use the, the optimal number of compartments in model one. And this is what we get when we, when we do that fitting to the data. So um, the blue, bluer colors here um, correspond to um, a smaller number of oocyst stages, and then we increase the number of oocyst stages. And then the red uh, corresponds to model two, uh, which had the continuous rupture function. And if we just look at model two first, um, we see that in all cases for all initial oocinete densities, we get a pretty good fit simultaneously to the oocyst count and sporozoite score data. But if we look at model one with just two oocyst, bursting oocyst stages, uh, now there are cases where we get a really good fit to the oocyst data, but a very poor fit to the um, oocanit data. And so that, that um, is again coming from the fact that uh, the, um, the time spent in the oocyst stage is gamma distributed and it would correspond to that picture that I showed earlier. Whoops, going the wrong way where we have a really shallow increase in this cumulative distribution function. But uh, just eyeballing that um, those fits isn't sufficient. So we need to use some kind of metric to help us decide um, between the different models and what number of compartments would be best for model one. 
Um, so the metric that we use is called the Akaike information criterion. And um, so that's what is plotted on the vertical axis. And on the horizontal axis is the number of bursting oocyst compartments. So the important thing to know is that the smaller the um, AIC is, um, the better fit the model has to the data. Uh, and the blue curve corresponds to the AICC for model one for different values of n, the number of OASIS compartments. And this black uh, dashed curve is the AICC for model two with the continuous bursting function. So if we look at an initial ukanite density of 100, then you can see that there are some intermediate numbers of bursting oocyst stages that give a better fit to the data than model two, although they perform pretty, they both perform pretty well. They have both give um, very close fits. And then there are cases like um, the treatment where the the initial blood meal has 4,000 ukanites, where model two always uh, does a better job of fitting the data than model one, because all of these points are higher. The AICC is always higher for model one than for model two. And in the end, uh, we weren't really able to answer the question of which model is, is better, uh, because half of the time model one outperform model two. Um, and so, we can't definitively say that using this uh, gamma distributed bursting time is a better way of um, modeling the process of, of oocyst bursting than the continuous rupture function. So there's definitely more to explore in that direction. Back to our initial question of how do we actually use all of this to calculate the time to infectiousness or the extrinsic incubation period. Um, so once we do our fitting, then we get estimates for our model parameters, and we can use those estimates to calculate um, EIP, the extrinsic incubation period. And really, the extrinsic incubation period is measured from the time of ingestion of the gametocyte all the way till the time of first appearance of sporozoites in the mosquito salivary glands. However, we are going to modify that a little bit since our data starts at the ukanite stage, but the process from gametocyte ingestion to the, the formation of ukanites is very short. So that, um, so that length of time shouldn't make uh, too big of a difference. But one big difference is uh, that there's, um, if so as I mentioned, time to infectiousness is often um, treated as the appearance of the first sporozoite into the mosquito salivary glands. But if the mosquito has just one sporozoite, then it's perhaps unlikely to actually pass on an infection to a human. And so some people have argued that a slightly different uh, metric should be used to determine the time at which a mosquito becomes infectious. And so what we chose is the time when half of the um, bursting oocysts have actually burst. Um, and, uh, um, and so that we call T star, and we can compute that from both either one of our models in different ways. So the sum, this first uh, term here is the average length of the ukanite stage, and then this T star is the time that it takes for half of the oocyst to burst. And that gives us our estimate of the extrinsic incubation period. And so this is what those results look like as a function of the initial ukinete density um, from 100 to 4,000 initial ukinetes in that blood meal. The blue circles correspond to our estimate of the uh, time to infectiousness using model one, using the best number of um, bursting oocyst compartments. And you notice that there's this kind of U-shaped pattern uh, between the time to infectiousness, EIP, and the initial ukanite density, which suggests that the, the time to infectiousness is shortest at intermediate um, initial ukanite densities. Um, and what that means is that the mosquito is more likely to transmit the infection before it dies if it started out with an initial ukanite density in that, uh, an intermediate ukanite density in that initial blood meal. The red stars correspond to the estimates that we get uh, fitting model two uh, to the data. And um, we also perform something called uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo, which allows us to get a distribution of parameter estimates. 
which in turn allows us to get a distribution of estimates for the time to infectiousness. And that's what these um, pink violin plots here represent. So you can get an idea of how um, there's a lot of variation in the estimate if we start out with a small initial Ukaini density versus a large one. But again, we have essentially that same pattern, U-shaped pattern. And uh, finally, we performed a sensitivity analysis. And what I want the take home message to be here is that if you see a big bar like this, it means that the uh, estimate of the time to infectiousness is sensitive to that particular parameter. And so whether we are looking at model one or model two, we found that the estimate was particularly sensitive to parameters that were associated with this bursting function. So that again, um, uh, allows us to um, think about what types of um, uh, experiments might be conducted to better inform our models in the future. So to summarize briefly, um, in the first segment of this talk, I talked about parasite diversity and showed that including that randomness in the parasite dynamics within a mosquito was really important. And our modeling showed that new parasite sequences are frequently passed on from mosquito to human. And then in this discussion about estimating time to infectiousness, we were able to identify some parameters um, of interest that, that further experimental studies could help to inform. And we, by this trial and error of different mathematical models, um, we were able to identify certain uh, structures in the model that were necessary to be able to capture the um, patterns that we saw in the data, in particular, distinguishing between oocysts that would burst and oocysts that would not. And uh, as I've just mentioned, um, a, an intermediate number of parasites in that initial blood meal um, seems to promote transmission by, make, by essentially uh, leading to a faster time to infectiousness in the mosquito. And some important caveats here are that um, our model um, ignores and the data ignores that a variation that you might expect um, early on in the parasite life cycle from the ingestion of gametocytes to the formation of the eukinetes. So that fertilization process could introduce a lot of variation. And so it's, it's not clear how that would impact our, our um, final results on the estimates of, of the time to infectiousness. And then I didn't mention that uh, the parasite species and mosquito combination is, it's not uh, a human malaria uh, species and they were not infecting humans, they were infecting mice. Um, and so uh, again, conducting these experiments in different systems with a different parasite species and mosquito combination um, could be really important to better inform what might happen in um, uh, human malaria. And then there was that disagreement between model of choice. Um, so again, half of the time one model performed better than the other. Um, so there's still a lot to explore here. So thank you again for all being here. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, I, I don't see any questions, but maybe one of the panelists would like to make a question or someone, I see one just popped up, so let me, uh, can you see this? I'll read it to you. So it said, um, you performed a, uh, a parameter sensitivity analysis for the models. Did you consider performing any analysis to check for structural sensitivity as well? well that's a great question. Uh, so when we did the, um, the Markov chain Monte Carlo, we can see things like correlations between model parameters. And so there are definitely some issues with um, identifiability. We didn't uh, do structural identifiability, but this would fall under practical identifiability um, when we're fitting to data. Um, but some of those, those uh, correlations between parameters were not too surprising, like the different pathways of leaving the eukinete stage. You can either an eukinete can die due to natural mortality or can uh, progress to an oocyst stage. And those two parameters are, are highly correlated with each other. Um, and so this is again where um, where the modeling can can kind of help guide maybe some future experiments to try to estimate one of those parameters so that it does actually become practically identifiable. Okay, thank you. Um, 
I don't see uh, anything else except one person, uh, Miranda said uh, uh, a really great talk, Olivia. Uh, I agree with that. Uh, but does anyone else want to ask a question? Does one of the panelists want to ask a question? So um, Olivia, thank you very much. That was great. Um, so I, I guess I, my question is about scaling issues. Um, so how do you move from this kind of within host model to informing the parameters in a sort of more standard, I guess, epi kind of model? And I'm sure you've thought about that. So this is an opportunity to say something about it. Yes. So, um, yeah, so that is something that Lauren and I have started working on. Um, well, we start, we've been working on it for a while, but um, progress is a little slow at the moment. Um, but um, yeah, so there we are looking at a simulation model, uh, trying to tie that uh, stochastic parasite lifecycle model that I introduced um, in the first portion um, to a, um, a population level transmission model. And it is challenging because there's a lot of decisions that you have to make about at, at various stages, like how many, you know, you, we, we put in two genotypes into a mosquito, but then several genotypes come out and then we have to, um, that, that, that makes the things kind of computationally challenging that you have this um, change in the um, starting, um, in the diversity of that population that's passed on to another individual. Um, but yeah, so that's the approach that we're taking is a, is a, a completely uh, stochastic simulation model. Um, yeah, I don't know if that answers your question. Or <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, I, I know they're challenging this for sort of first step. I, I, another question is how sort of the, the body of uh, evolutionary theory that does sort of population scale, um, basically population genetics kinds of models um, has or has not informed the epidemiological community through the, the kinds of essentially genetic data that you have here. Um, and, uh, and is that an open, in other words, if this were, if you were starting out on a new project, um, is this something that would be interesting and for those who have particularly evolutionary interests? Yes, yeah, so I'm less familiar with that um, side of, of things, the evolutionary aspect. Um, I, I have seen some models um, trying to tie uh, population genetics to um, between host transmission in the context of how things like um, particular um, genes will be spread through a population. So for example, uh, you know, looking at um, genetically modified mosquitoes and how uh, that, um, you know, altered gene would be passed on um, over generations of mosquitoes. So that type of work I have seen, um, but I'm less familiar with the population um, kind of evolutionary aspects of things. Okay, well, thank you very much. 